So, lung infection month two, and the CT scan shows it is receding from my right lung, but still here in the left one. So, welcome to antibiotics round three. I apologize if I yawn a lot in this video, but who knew you needed to breathe to sleep? <laughs> Hello lovely people, I'm Jessica. I'm a disabled content creator and I make videos about disability, chronic illness and LGBTU plus issues in an entertaining and educational way. And yes, I do dress like it's the 1950s every day. Vintage style, not vintage values. Although you'll have to excuse my hair today, I, I do not. I cannot. If that sounds like something you'd enjoy, then subscribe. This video is sponsored by Subshark. Find out more about their amazing VPN service later. Today we're going to be talking about words. Specifically, two little words that have some pretty big implications to the disabled community. The first one, ableism. Boom. The word you were all expecting. You've certainly come across the word ableism if you're disabled, know someone who's disabled, or I've spent any time thinking about disability or on the internet. But the second one, disabledism, might be a bit more unfamiliar, though it's something we're hearing more and more about. And as we'll see, that's for a very good reason. So come and take a little trip down the language lane with me. As far as basic definitions go, both words refer to the discrimination that disabled people experience. Ableism is discrimination in favour of able-bodied people, and disabledism is discrimination against disabled people. Did that sound like the same thing to you? Are you sat there saying, but Jessica, these are the same thing, just seen from different sides of the fence? And I, you'd be right, kind of. But are there no disabled people who are technically able-bodied? I mean, for one thing. Are we all just using wheelchairs 24-7? One could argue that, I mean, if you're thinking of doing something that favours one group, you're implicitly excluding the other group. Could we argue that? Like a building with only steps up to the front entrance is ableist because it's favouring that able-bodied people can walk up. And it's disabledist because it's excluding the disabled people who can't manage the stairs. So, in that sense, ableism and disabledism can be interchangeable. But... The cynical man you may now have another question. Jessica, if they basically mean the same thing, why do we need two separate words at all? Isn't this just making up new words and labels to... And I'm going to stop you right there before you inadvertently do a disabledism. How? Well, keep watching and you'll find out. Let's break down why the two are different, what they really look like to a disabled person like myself, and why disabledism is actually a really powerful word that we should all be using more often. Ableism. First, start with some familiar territory. Back in lockdown last year, I made a fun video to try and explain what ableism is in the simplest possible terms. If you haven't seen it already, I'd highly recommend it. You can click the card above. And not just because it, you know, features my evil but debonair ableist twin. Ableist assumptions are something that disabled people come across on a pretty daily basis. They're often unconscious, or at least not ill-intentioned, and most likely come from a place of thoughtlessness or negligence, and let's be honest, that's something we're all guilty of at times. These ableist notions can be, nevertheless, obstructive, insulting and downright damaging. Businesses, big companies and other organisations can find themselves doing institutionalised ableism by failing to provide the basic accessibility arrangements that a disabled colleague might need, or by making assumptions about what all of their employees are capable of. Like, in a survey, 7 out of 10 people in the UK with mobility and sensory impairment reported having difficulty accessing goods and services, mainly because they struggle getting physical access to places. On the other hand, you'll often run into interpersonal ableism in conversation with individuals, whether strangers or, you know, friends. While meaning comments can come across as dreadfully naive or dismissive and can leave us feeling ignored, misunderstood and somehow inadequate. You should expect mean comments if you're going to be disabled online, honey. Oh, sorry. Was I given the choice to be an entirely different person? That's because ableism is based on the underlying belief Belief that disabled people should somehow be fixed in order to become more able, you know, like everyone else. Hang on a minute, what does it actually mean to be, quote, able? You know, people are very quick to have a go at defining disability. When you take away the dis, what are you actually left with? Some people whose job it is to think about these things have suggested that an able person be defined as someone who is ready and capable of contributing to society. <gasps> Are we all doing that just by being here? I mean, the teensy bit of scrutiny that, I mean, it kind of opens up a whole kind of world. Who's going to be the grand judge of whether or not someone's capable? What does it actually mean to contribute? Contribute what? Do you have to be working to be a worthwhile individual? What is work? Wait, why does being disabled necessarily stop you from working? What exactly is it that society is demanding of us? Will there be a 
test at the end? What are we doing with people who fail the test? What if you just broke your leg on the day of the test? So you're not very useful right now. Have you ever met a baby? They're not very productive. It's just a whole other philosophical problem that I'm not really here to answer. I came across another definition of ableness, which seems to reduce all the beauty and complexity of our existence to the coldest of biological analysis. An able person, the one that everyone should apparently aspire to be, is a so-called species-typical individual. Basically, they're the average Joe. The person that's slap bang in the middle of all possible variations of what it means to be a human. Oh, but that's problematic too. Because when you think about it, nobody's average. That's just how averages work. There'll be some people who are better at doing certain things, and some people who are worse at doing other things, and we all kind of fall in the middle of this, but they're not in the middle of that. However you look at it, ableness is an ideal that actually nobody really matters up to, whether they identify as or meet a legal definition to be disabled or not. It's certainly a sliding scale, but where should we pin our ableist expectations on that scale? What is the scale? What should be our base assumptions about what people can and cannot do, and whether they deserve reasonable adjustments to equal the playing field? Right now, society's expectations are at a level that leaves no room for the wonderful colour and variety of human nature, and ultimately leads to ableism as a weight dragging us down to a bland, beige and boring average, which doesn't even really exist. Speaking of things that don't exist, dragons. Genuinely. Anyone else obsessed with the House of Dragon? How are we supposed to wait until Spring 2024 for the next series? But while being pedantic about language, I want to show an interesting viewpoint about the nature of disability itself. We often hear people described as having a disability, and I've done that in this video, and I typically describe myself as being disabled. I list it in the same way I list any of my other characteristics. But there's a school of thought that says since a person doesn't actually have a disability in the same way they might have brown eyes or curly hair, well they actually have is an impairment, and then the disability comes from how society responds to it. This is the social model of disability, and it allows for a degree of flexibility, right? Because society's response to said impairment determines whether or not it's going to be something that impacts your life. Take vision problems, for example. If you need glasses here in the UK, we're pretty well set up to get you checked out. Quick puff from the corners, measured up and sent on your way with a fashionable bit of eyewear. You can carry on with your daily life with minimal disruption, and needing glasses in the UK doesn't typically count as having a disability. But elsewhere in the world, in a rural village in a developing country, where that slick system doesn't exist, a simple need for glasses can become a serious disability and can become a life and death problem. So disability in itself is not a personal characteristic, it's a social construct, but it's one that can be deconstructed with the right approach to ability. But to do that, we need to address the darker side of disability and justice, and that's disablerism. Before we do that though, let's take a lighter note and skip to thinking about brighter days with today's sponsor, Surfshark. Have you ever dreamt about getting up one day and travelling the world, packing up your things and never looking back? I mean, we're all at the back end of a pandemic. Who isn't ready to run out the house screaming at this point? Well, if you have the travel bug, but as you sit and scroll looking at flights, you're stopped in your tracks with the sheer panic of how will you ever be able to keep up with season 24 of Made in Chelsea if you're off gallivanting across the globe? How will you know who Mars is dating if you're abroad? Well, fear not. Surfshark is here. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that lets you set your device's location to anywhere in the world. That means you can get yourself with the Eiffel Tower, gaze at the Northern Lights, and drive down Route 66, all while keeping up with the dog. I mean, maybe not that, that one, don't watch TV and drive while you're anywhere in the world. It even works for your whole family, because you can use one account across an unlimited number of devices. And while you're planning your trip, and booking those flights, did you know, you might be shown a different price online based on the location of your computer, location, and by using a VPN to set your computer's location to a different country, you could be unlocking better prices. Golly, Surfshark really does have your back for your future travels. I'm so excited for you. Please go somewhere nice. Head to surfshark.deals slash Jessica, linked in the description, for three months free and 85% off when you use code Jessica. And if you don't love it, or you decide to stay in your bubble and put travel to another country on the back of your to-do list, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee. Oh, Wait, was that a special holiday period offer that I just heard? <gasps> Why, yes it is! If you sign up before the 31st of December, you receive 85% off. Uh-huh, an extra 2% more than you usually get. And every percentage point count, my lungs hurt. Disabilism. To recap. <laughs> 
Disablism differs from the more familiar ableism by being a discrimination against disabled people. Yeah, we're not just forgetting people now. And while this definitely includes most ableist behaviours, it also encompasses a much uglier form of discrimination, one that stems from the belief that disabled people are truly really inferior to others. This can lead to the more sinister, oppressive and abusive behaviours. I know, I'm sorry guys, it does get less cheery. Oh my god, like I was being super cheery before. Okay, wind it back. Wind it back, Jessica. It's not just about not considering the needs of disabled people, you know, not thinking to have a braille menu or a tea loop for hearing aids or having a sign language interpreter for any of your events or maybe even captioning on your programs, channel four but rather it's actively doing things to exclude and sideline them. At this point, you've been listening to me for a while, so I'm guessing that's, you know, not your general viewpoint. But I promise you, it is out there. And by giving it a name, it's easier to take more seriously and to try and address. Because even today, to be disabled is to be discriminated against. And as a population as a whole, that leads to some pretty shocking statistics. In a survey done in 2003, less than half of disabled people who were of working age were actually in work, compared with 80% of non-disabled people. Fewer than 1% of people aged 16 to 24 with a physical impairment were accepted into university, compared to 8% of young people with no health problems. Up to four in five websites surveyed didn't meet the basic accessibility criteria laid down by the dedicated web accessibility initiative, which recommends things like captions, good color contrast, and text alternatives to images that screen readers can use. Nearly a quarter of disabled people reported receiving harassment in public specifically because of their impairment. Behind all of these statistics, there are personal stories of hurt and depression that comes from disabledism too. Take Tara Flood, for example. She is a gold medal winning Paralympic swimmer who was born without forearms. But before she became an athlete, she worked in a bank where she said she experienced discrimination that was sometimes subtle, sometimes painfully obvious. She was often excluded from client meetings, even when she was the team leader and had good relations with her clients on the phone. When wanting to move to a different, more public-facing department, she was told that she might not be the right image for the bang, and she was overlooked for promotions time and time again. Most tragically of all, Tara let all of this slide because of the way she'd been taught to view herself. She'd been sent to a special school when she was two, and thinks that this segregated education played a big part in her relationships with others and her approach to these kinds of situations. The simplest attitudes are teaching kids from a young age that they don't deserve the same opportunities as their non-disabled friends, which is just... <laughs> Well, there are no words. And while things have got better since Tara Flood was in school, there's still way too much of it around. I see it in my comments all the time. There are deeply ingrained systems and structures that treat disabled people as objects of pity and compassion who need charity rather than fully functioning members of society with, you know, full civil rights just living our lives. Because of that, disabled people's rights end up woefully underrepresented and under-resourced. Those with the disabilities often don't have a voice in the policies and decisions that govern their own lives. For instance, certain healthcare services are rationed based on assessments of a patient's quality of life, with people with disabilities being denied treatments because that someone decides that it's not like their life is going to be you know, terribly exciting anyway. They won't need to leave the house for more than an hour a day. What on earth could a sick person have to do? It's not like they've got friends. Ultimately, these approaches are making judgments about the value of a disabled person's life, something we would scarcely consider for someone without a disability. And it doesn't end there. Many of us will be fortunate enough not to encounter it in our daily lives, but active mistreatment and deaths have come about just because a person is disabled. Also, yes, I have realised that there is a tree surgeon outside. He is not my tree surgeon. I can do nothing about him. It might be motivated by fear, prejudice, worries about the cost of healthcare, mercy, or just hate. But in the 15 years between 1990 and 2004, nearly 700 disabled people died as a direct result of disabledism. Let's face it, this is a terrifying reality and a massive injustice, and more people should be talking about it. The other great injustices in the world, sexism and racism, have been addressed through high-profile campaigns. Women died for suffrage, and the BLM movement has moved mountains for racial equality. As a result of these, there's now widespread acknowledgement that gender and race discrimination has no place 
place in modern society. So what are we going to do about disability then? I mean, this isn't really something that's going to be fixed by passing new laws. In fact, the law around disability discrimination is pretty much on a par with that for gender and racial discrimination. It's just that the lived experiences are so different. Neither should it be entirely up to us as individuals to fix. It's going to take a lot more awareness and a lot more support from all corners of society. And for that, having a word like disablism to neatly and concisely describe what's going on is a powerful weapon to wield. It's arguably even more powerful than ableism because the ill intentions that it implies are right there. Ultimately, disability is complex and there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. But people with disabilities are people whose differences should be celebrated, not suffered. Our contribution to society should be appreciated and our rights over our own lives should be respected. Making the world a better place for disabled people is actually making the world a better place for everyone. It's a win-win solution. So whether you want to call out disabilisms or rail against ableist assumptions, go forth and use your words to make the world a better place. I know you'll be amazing at it. Thank you so much for watching and for putting up with my uh, inability to breathe. I hope you took a lot from this video and found it thought-provoking. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Remember to click the link in the description surfshark.deals slash jessica and use code jessica for 85% off and three months extra for free. If you're new here please consider subscribing. I breathe better most of the time and I'll see you in my next video. Mwah.